women in Catholicism have lots to say, have lots of opinions, and have a very felt sense that the whole story has not been told in the Bible because it's so male focused and uses such male language for God. I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to keep practicing their faith or their belief system, but they feel that it may be enters in conflict with their sexuality? The first thing I would suggest is pay attention to how the pieces of your faith tradition land in your body, especially with something like Catholicism that is thousands of years old and has lots of different pieces up to it. Some things might sit really well and feel really good in your body, and that's good, and that's holy, and that's fine. And also, some parts of it will not feel good. And so the first thing I would suggest is people pay attention. If, for example, if you're going to mass, there are some prayers that might not sit well in your body if you pay attention to it, but you might love the singing or you might love the stained glass windows in the sunlight there. And just getting clear on which pieces serve you and kind of fill you up and make you feel connected to God and which pieces make you feel shame or make you feel guilt that isn't yours and letting those pieces go. Because Catholicism is a religion that has lots of different experiences piled on top of it that all exist for a specific reason, but we're not taught the reasons that many of those things came into existence. And so then we think we're just supposed to take all of it. And it's a lot to hold because it's a lot of people and experiences to put on top of ourselves. So getting really clear with your body about what feels good and what doesn't is the first step. That's interesting. It'll be like a mindful type of approach to it. Listen to your body, see how it responds. And then you mentioned there that there can be some guilt and shame that arises that is not yours. Right. What do you mean by that? Like, who whose is it then? <laughs> yes, no, great question. So, <laughs> um, I was once speaking with a friend who was raised Episcopalian and she said something that was really interesting to me because I just kind of asked her, like, can you explain what Episcopalianism is? And she said, Shannon, it's basically Catholicism without the guilt. And it's a little bit hard to hear if you're in Catholicism because as someone, she's not in that space But to hear someone else reflect that back to you, it makes you a lot clearer on how much guilt and shame you're sitting in as part of just the ecosystem you're in. And it's hard to notice it since you've been in it, since I've been in it my whole life. But to have someone else reflect it back to me, it made me pay a lot more attention to when do I feel guilty and when is it not actually mine? So for example, one of the prayers that often get said at the beginning of mass is a prayer that starts with like begging God for forgiveness for your sins and basically saying, I'm a sucky person. God, please forgive me. There's nothing I can do about it. And prayers like that, when they're not clear on what you're asking for forgiveness for, can really seep into your whole mindset because then you're kind of just apologizing for being who you are. And that's not respectful to you. That's not respectful to the community around you because it seeps in this idea that you were never worthy of belonging to God in the first place. And that's really hard because you want to feel connected to a higher power. You want to feel connected to a creator. But if you're telling yourself that you're just a screw up the whole time, it makes it really hard to even feel worthy of saying, hey, God, I need help. Or, hey, God, what the heck's going on here? And so there's a lot of shame. One of the people I work with talks a lot about it as Catholic shame. And I think that's helpful phrasing because guilt typically implies that there's a specific thing you know you feel guilt about. But shame is just kind of this world that you just live in. And as long as that shame is sitting in your body, it's going to continue to not feel good because it's hard to move from a place of shame. Do you think there is a specific narrative that applies to women specifically within that bigger narrative of I'm a sinner, I'm not enough? Yes. So I'll say this from my own experience with the church that I've attended for a while, and it's a Catholic parish, but, you know, I'll attend, they'll have scripture studies once a week that I will sometimes go to. And it's really interesting watching the women in those spaces because nine times out of 10, it's the women saying things or having critiques or having like pushback on some of what we're coming up with. So I see it all the time. Women in Catholicism have lots to say, have lots of opinions and have a very felt sense that the whole story has not been told in the Bible because it's so male focused and uses such male language for God. But then I go to these spaces where Catholic women 
aren't necessarily structurally kept out of saying anything. And we're the ones who have things to say. And I think that's a really helpful reclaiming space for us because it allows us to see each other and acknowledge each other. And the men take a back seat for a little bit. And it's not that men are bad or that we don't want them there. But when you look at who's been pushed out of the spaces of power, it makes a lot of sense that the women are the ones saying the most things and showing up at these meetings to say these things. Yeah, it's important. That's very important because, and, and I have also heard of like, and again, this is probably not within the, the framework of Catholicism, but it probably is within the framework of religion or maybe Christianity. Um, I have a friend that she's very, it's very interesting because for me, I am 22, I think. So for me, it's normal to have a lot of friends and for people my age not to be religious at all. And that that's normal and that's fine. But she holds on to a certain, not religion, but like a belief or this practice, right? And she believes in it and it's the one that her family has. But she has this very critical way of seeing things. So she still practices and she, for example, has made the, the choice of waiting until marriage to have sex and it's her choice and she tells me it's my choice nobody's forcing me into this even though like this is what they prefer I don't do it for them I do it for me this is my choice and I find that very interesting and and one day she was telling me how because her her sister is in this sort of not that much of a good relationship but she's married and has kids and they are both all of them you know go to this church and and all this and they ha they hold also some meetings in there and then she tells me it was very weird for me to see how they would tell women basically that will send them the message that they have to just allow their husbands to do whatever they're doing and you know and if they ever they're if they're doing something that's hurting them something that's not okay uh and that being said you know like maybe you're lying or maybe not saying you know good words and things things like this that damage any type of relationship not just romantic relationships uh, they would be kind of instructed almost to just like not do anything and instead be like very supportive and like instead think oh maybe he had a bad day or maybe you know whatever and like there is not this space to tell women or for them to think of their worth in that dynamic you know and i think that's also very important because well well religions and all these practices are important i think those things shouldn't be shouldn't shouldn't be happening anywhere like no human being should be put you know under any other just because anything <laughs> So it's also something important when talking about religion, I believe, which is, you know, this can happen. And it's not only that it can happen, I think, as you've mentioned, as females, women are reclaiming certain spaces. I think it's not only certain religions or religious scenarios. It's been in the world in general, the Western world and all the modernization and all the European ideas that women actually ended up having this place below men at some point. Right. So I don't know if, I guess like a cool question to ask would also be um, if you think there is anything that, or you've seen it because you've mentioned it a little bit, that religions or uh, maybe churches or the places that you maybe are more close to can to actually, you know, like actually give women back yeah. these things. <clears throat> yeah. Like, is there anything that, could, that, they're, that they could be doing differently or better? Yeah. I mean, let's go big. Catholicism should not have like we decide who our priests are based on their genitalia. That's the fact of the matter. No one says it that way, but like that's what we base it on. So the main thing is we need to stop genderizing the roles. All of that said, it's interesting, you know, people, at least in the U.S., and the U.S. is very U.S. centric, right? So like we don't think about people beyond our, the national borders very often. But Catholicism has 1.3 billion people and it's a worldwide religion. You do not get to be a or, an organization of that size without allowing a vast amount of differentiation in how people want to do it. That's just that's just how the organization growth works. The Vatican doesn't tell us this because it helps them for us to kind of stay in our lanes, but people are practicing Catholicism in very different ways across the world. So from parish to parish, you know, it really, a lot of people stay in a parish because of a priest specifically. And if the priest moves, sometimes they'll go with him. And so that should already tell us that it's something about the independent relationships that build the connections to God, not the Catholic church itself all the time. The first thing that Catholic parishes and Catholic churches need to make sure their members understand is that every parish is different. Every parish has its own culture, way of doing things. There are Roman Catholic women priests 
who have all been excommunicated by the Vatican. But, you know, these things already exist. And if people feel called, people need to move towards God the way they feel moved towards God. And it's not anyone's job to keep, you know, barriers around those things. So if women want to be priests, women need to know that's an option for them. That's number one. If men want to be nuns, they also need to know that's an option for them. Uh, But because so much of what we see doesn't get critiqued and we don't have a lot of space in Catholicism to critique it on our own, those conversations just don't happen. But I've been at parishes that had very active LGBTQ groups. And then I've been at parishes that have had transphobic stuff put up on their walls. So the, the array exists and it's making sure people understand that the array exists and that there are options for them in the space if they want to find them. And if they don't, that's okay too.